name's Bob Henderson. I'm the former president of the Battle of Nashville Preservation Society, and we're at Kelly's Point Battlefield Greenway in West Nashville. This is a site that we saved uh, back in 2004 that was a cooperative effort between uh, politicians, uh, developers, and pres preservationists. Uh, at the time, um, uh, Metro uh, Mayor uh, Bill Purcell, Vice Mayor Ronnie Stein, uh, with the help of uh, Councilman Bob Bogan, uh, Shane Dennison with the Metro Greenways system, uh, the Battle of Nashville Preservation Society, JDN uh, Realty, and the Civil War Roundtable of the United Kingdom, uh, who helped fund some of the signage that we'll look at here. Uh, this is basically uh, the site that uh, is um, not written about much in the Civil War, but it's actually uh, the beginning of the Battle of Nashville on December 2nd, uh, 1864. Uh, this was the last major offensive of the Confederacy, uh, and it's very significant in that Nashville had been a key staging area for the Union occupation of the uh, South in the Western theater of the war. Uh, since 1862, uh, federal forces had taken Nashville and used it as a springboard for most of, most of the Western theater. Uh, by December of 1864, there were about 75,000 Union troops in Nashville, about 49,000 combat ready, and after the bloody Battle of Franklin, the Confederate Army of Tennessee, under the command of General John Bell Hood, advanced here to cut off the river at this point to prevent any further resupply to the federal forces in Nashville. Uh, from that point, they uh, were out here for about two weeks uh, blockading the river against uh, the U.S. Navy. Uh, there are about 25,000 Confederates that anchored their position at this point, running through Bellmead, Green Hills, and past Murfreesboro Pike to try to hem in the Union uh, occupying forces in Nashville. It's a very significant battle for a lot of reasons, and we'll talk about some more of the signage that is back on the river. We're back here on the Cumberland River at Kelly's Point Greenway, the Overlook. And uh, on this site, December 2nd, 1864, the Confederate Army of Tennessee initiated a two-week siege of Nashville. And this was to be the last significant offensive military operation of the Civil War by the South. It was also one of the most significant battles between the Confederate Cavalry and the United States Navy. Since late winter 1862, Nashville had been a key staging and supply base for the Union Army in the Western Theater of the War. Since February 25, 1862, it had been under Union occupation longer than any other major Confederate city. Many of the Southern soldiers here had not seen home in over three long years. They would find that Nashville, as well as their army, had changed dramatically since the beginning of the war. Advancing here after the bloody Battle of Franklin, Confederate General John Bell Hood anchored his left flank at this point. More than 25,000 Confederates began an investment line running from this position, arching more than 12 miles east, in an attempt to hem in Nashville on the south side of the Cumberland River. This made Nashville the most extensive geographical ba battlefield of the Civil War in terms of sheer distance. Colonel Kelly had previously fought the Navy in the Battle of Fort Henry and Donelson, Eastport, Mississippi, on the Ohio River in the daring Johnsonville raid only weeks before Nashville. Known as the Fighting Parson because of his status as a Methodist minister and regimental chaplain, he later played a key role in the formation of Vanderbilt University in 1873. He unsuccessfully ran for governor of Tennessee in 1890 on the Prohibitionist ticket. Early on the morning of December 3rd, the Confederates captured two Union supply transports, the Prairie State and the Prima Donna, including prisoners, livestock, and supplies. They disabled a third supply ship, the Magnet, which was later found four miles downstream. Shortly after partially unloading the vessels, the U.S. Navy arrived on the scene, driving away the Confederates who had depleted their ammunition. The Navy flotilla subsequently recovered the vessels. Between December 3rd and December 15th, up to seven regiments of Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee Confederate Cavalry effectively blockaded all transportation along the Cumberland River against seven heavily armed Navy gunboats here. 
The U.S. Navy unsuccessfully tried to dislodge the river batteries in six separate engagements in the weeks preceding the Battle of Nashville. Colonel Kelly had the Navy confused about the force they were up against here. By the deceptive movements of their mobile gun emplacements along the high ground here between this position and a half mile upstream, elements of Kelly's cavalry convinced the Navy they were a force over four times their actual strength. This was a military tactic that was very characteristic of the Confederate cavalry under Forrest Command. During the fourth engagement on December 6th, the USS Neosho was hit more than 100 times by artillery rounds without being sunk. The sailors in blue came close to losing her, however, when two Confederate rounds breached the monitor's iron plating and one lodged unexploded in the vessel's powder magazine. The ship's quartermaster, John Desenbach, with pilot John H. Farrell, became the recipients of the Medal of Honor for their actions that day, saving the boat's colors when they were shot away by heavy Confederate gunfire. By December 15th, the Union combat forces in Nashville were increased to more than 49,000. By feigning an attack on the other end of the battlefield while dividing the Confederate left along Richland Creek, the Union would crush the Army of Tennessee in the center in one of the most decisive battles of the war. Kelly's artillery, along with five regiments from Chalmers Cavalry, was one of the few Confederate units to hold their ground and force the overwhelmingly larger Union cavalry into retreat on the opening day of the Battle of Nashville. Noteworthy in this countercharge near present-day I-40 in Charlotte Pike was the participation of a prominent 75-year-old civilian named Mark Robertson Cockrell. It is said that he led into the charge and galloped into the fray with the use of only one arm holding his father's Revolutionary War musket in one hand and the reins to the horse in his mouth. When it was learned that Federal forces had overrun the cavalry headquarters at the Bellamy Plantation three miles southeast of here, Colonel Kelly withdrew to rendezvous with the main force from retreat six miles to the east. The night of December 15th, they abandoned their position here and reconnected with the main force near Hillsborough Road and the present-day Old Hickory Boulevard. This was just in time to provide a critical rear guard that fought a delaying action from Brentwood south more than 100 miles crossing into Alabama and then over the Tennessee River above Muscle Shoals, where the Union pursuit was called off. Thus ended the last great attempt by the South to reclaim the state of Tennessee or advance to recover any of its lost territory. The once great Army of Tennessee would be surrendered by General Joseph E. Johnston four months later near Durham Station, North Carolina, April 26, 1865.